Welcome to Story Radio, the podcast for readers, writers and lovers of short stories everywhere. Today, we're listening to Jacqueline by Tatum Anderson. photograph my mother liked to show everybody was of my cousin Jacqueline. It was taken in a real photographer's studio somewhere in a London. Jacqueline stood glassy like a film star next to a vase of flowers, slim and unsmiling. Her hair was ironed and shiny like liquid. It was the only photograph Jacqueline ever sent back home. My mother liked to tell the neighbours how Jacqueline had prospered over there. Anyone who came with sewing work would hear how proud she was that her niece had made such a fine nurse. But when she talked about me, she tutted. She said, Look at that one, afraid of our own shadow, always sitting barefoot reading in the yard. So, when the British Embassy advertised for nurses to go and train in our England, just like Jacqueline, I decided to be the first in line. I didn't expect so many other girls would be at the embassy when I got there. By the time I got to the front of the queue two hours later, I was hot and messy. An English lady seated behind a long desk flickered through my school certificate. A fan slapping away the scalding air around her. I told her I wanted to be a state registered nurse because this is what my cousin Jacqueline had become. Flatting my shiny forehead and neck with a handkerchief, she looked me up and down in a pinched up voice and said she would be recommending me as a state enrolled nurse instead. I wanted to go to England so bad I agreed straight away. The English lady gave me details of a hospital somewhere in the countryside. If accepted, I would have to make my own way over to England. When I asked if anybody would come pick me up when I arrived, she laughed with a kind of snort, then asked me if I had money for a taxi. I said my mother would find the fare. Good, she said. Then that would be sufficient to bring me up to the nurse's home. Next girl, please. My mother was quiet for a long time when I told her I was leaving for England. She said she would write and ask Jacqueline to come take me to the nurse's home. My mother booked my passage on the boat. 22 days at sea and I hated every churning second of it. The horizon swayed and so did my stomach. We stopped at a port where the sea was deep blue, like home, and dazzled like stars were bouncing off of it. I said how lovely Southampton was. Someone said, no, we're not there yet. This is Sicily. The sea at Southampton slotted against the harbour walls. It was the colour of strained, callaloo greens. The sky above it was like a blue-grey tub. I breathed in this new sharp English air. It pricked me all over. The English lady from the embassy said a blazer would do for arrival in England. So that was what I was wearing. It was February and the wind came all the way through the blazer to the thin travel dress my mother made. Maybe blazers in England were different from blazers in Jamaica, I thought because for the first time since I left, I longed for the searing heat of warm. I know Jacqueline would have worn the right clothes. I bet she didn't miss home, not for one cold second. She had become too big for it, always on her way up and out. That is what everybody said. Me and she grew up together because her mother and mine were sisters and lived two streets apart. 
I didn't even know which one of the sisters was my mother until I was five. That's how close we were, like twins. But then there was a time, and I don't remember exactly when, but when Jacqueline began to soar, she can recite poetry word perfectly or complete her arithmetic without tears. It was Jacqueline who got the highest marks year after year at secondary school, not me. She was a real beauty too. Everyone looked up to her as she went higher and higher. I, following her shadow, waited for her to come back and fetch me. She always used to come back. When she got herself a proper boyfriend, the kind with melting eyes, a thin moustache and a real job downtown, it was me she let into her secrets. She had started nurse training in town, then I met him on the ward. I remember how she put her finger to her crimson lips and crept off to meet him after dark. I will her back for her liaisons, which was what she called them, and late at night she returned, getting into my bed, and stifled her giggles under the sheets. She never acknowledged how much I had to lie for her. She never thanked me. This one time I told her how frantic our mothers were, looking for her everywhere. If they found out she was with him, they would have whipped her into next week, I said. But she didn't seem to hear me. Instead, she whispered, breathless, all about this new boy, Lenworth. How nice he treated her. How he felt. That I must find someone as good as him. She smelled different then, not like the old Jacqueline. I watched the ships upload in Southampton as we disembarked. They were bringing mangoes on shore to the cowling of birds overhead. I bought two orange-green mangoes, one for me and one for Jacqueline, and then I dashed for the train to London. I heard the bangs of the carriage doors of the Southampton train for months afterwards. Each one made me start in my seat. Windows were wound down, letting in the coal and the rain, as arms reached outside to slam them shut. And then the train began to labour like an old man along the tracks. Away from the sea we went. I could see the dirty plumes, if pumped up in the thick blanket of the winter sky. The sun tried to cut through but managed only a cold light over the dark green stretches of England that whistled by. A man came along the train with sandwiches and I bought one but the bread was so full of holes I was still hungry. So I reached into my bag for the mango expecting the sweet taste like the ones from our tree back home. No. The bite was like the sunshine was turned down. We spluttered and puffed at last into London. The sixty of us from the ship, we were dressed in our Sunday best, hands flat on the windows, watching how the houses got closer together. A fog dropped like a veil over the train windows. Once in a while I could make out streets whizzing by. There, perhaps were traces of men and women in long coats, head bowed as a bare-legged child, running in the cold. The first person I saw in London when we pulled into the Waterloo station was not an Englishman. He was the colour of a dark, deep rum with a thin, long nose overhanging a white moustache. He stood there on the platform in a thick coat, tapping his foot while the train came in to a halt. He must have seen how much I shivered, pulling the flaps of my blazer together as I opened the train door. The day he came from Delhi was colder than this, he said with a smile. It was snowing that year. He held out his glove hands and pointed to his hat and coat. You must buy some of these, he said. 
I watched him head off to find his daughter. His tall frame soon disappeared among passengers getting off the boat train. Now I could see my reflection in the glass of the train door. My hat sloped off to one side with fluffs of hair poking outside everywhere. Somehow, even the travel dress was a lurid splatter of lemons and limes. Jacqueline, I knew, would surely smooth her hands over her hair to flatten it down with that resigned smile of hers. The great diamond-shaped railings that separated the platform from the main train station were parted and we passengers poured out like a great tropical technicolor wave into a black and white background. Before me was a wall of men waiting in sombre courts, babies wrapped tight in frills, women in their best dark London hats. They were still focusing past me, beside me, over my head. Soon eyes became excited, hands clasped together over mouths and arms opened with great smiles. The crowd surged forward, pushing me further into the wall of fragrances, of travel sweat, home and flowers and soap all at the same time. Now the tight hugs and squeals and kisses began. Chatter came loud and high-pitched, only periodically was it drowned out by a dead tone voice from the loudspeaker announcing the next train. But Jacqueline was not there. I was jostled by the crowd now, so many faces swimming around me. I raised my eyes. How high the great glass ceiling of the station stretched above my head. It looked to be held together by a giant steel cage. Through the gap, though the grey sea in light a noxious gas, I didn't see her in the weeks before she left for England. She did not come to say goodbye. My mother said only that she was gone. In a letter to her address she left, I told her that Lenworth had gone to Canada. There was no reply except the photograph. The feel of jumping, hugging bodies brought me back down to the joyful reunions of the station concourse. I imagined Jacqueline running towards me, screaming my name, arms outspread. Beyond us, the natives would go about their business with only quick glances in the direction as they did now. Matronly women, wrapped in heavy coats, dragged children along with their blue knees. Ladies in heels and matching gloves clicked by. Some hid behind the newspapers or studies, timetables. Even when they smoked cigarettes, people from London seemed to be in such a rush. But not one of them was Jacqueline. Over at a kiosk that said W.H. Smith, I watched a pair of bony men sweeping the concourse in long strokes. I began to compose my first letter to my mother. I would say that white people in that England were not so grand as they were back home. Here, they did the kind of jobs that gave them tired eyes and grubby hands. She would go straight round to tell my uncle. He still took Colonel Marcy and his wife to the club every week and waited with the other drivers outside. That was where they drank cocktails and lay at the sun all day on purpose, getting red. It was only when the sweeper returned, covering the same ground, that I realised how long I had waited for Jacqueline. The ship's passengers had almost all gone now. Before they left, a few offered accommodation if I wanted to come with them. They listed places I had never heard of, Clapham, Brixton. I said my sister was coming to fetch me. 
I waved at the last of them, the secure warmth of home seeping away. There were many wooden benches positioned in a crescent around the station, so I perched on the end of one, gripping hard the purse laying in my lap. And from there, I studied each person, looking for Jacqueline's gliding walk, her swaying hips, her face made up, a hat large and loud. That's how she looked that day, she told me Lenworth was the love of her life. She came into my house when my mother was out. With that wicked laugh of hers, she told me he was going to marry her and take her away after she qualified. That was the last time I saw her. On the wooden benches, a lady came to sit with her small child, a huge suitcase and a great basket. She was from the ship too. She said her husband hadn't turned up yet either, and he left home in 1959. The little girl wouldn't stop crying until I reached into my bag and passed her Jacqueline's mango. She grinned, clasping it in both hands. I was so thirsty that I began to slump. All the time I could hear my mother's voice in my ears telling me, Sit up straight, otherwise all those English people are going to think say you was born in a barn. I smoothed down my skirt and drew myself up as the shadows grew longer. According to the station clock, it was still the afternoon, but the sky through the glass ceiling threatened to let in a coming darkness. I began to cry under my breath. Perhaps Jacqueline got the wrong day. The woman beside me, Miss Deborah, was sighing and puffing too. Finally, she said she would have to telephone. When she went to find the telephone booths, we smuffled, me and the little girl she left sitting on my lap. I didn't want to stay here by myself in the station all night, waiting for Jacqueline, not with all these strange and smiling white people rushing around me. When she returned and picked up her little girl from my lap, I heard Miss Deborah say there, There now, you have to be a big girl. She told me that she could not get through to her husband and had wrung her niece living in a clapham, who was now on her way. It was her niece who reminded her that there was another waiting point by the steps outside the station. Her husband had first suggested it in his letter, Miss Deborah said, but she told him she would not be standing outside with a baby. I nodded when she said maybe I should try there. Yes, I had written down the address of the nurse's home. Yes, I had money for taxi if Jacqueline did not come. She kept tapping my shoulder telling me to be brave and waved as I looked for the exit. It was a great stone arch from which two flights of stairs led down to the street. I didn't want to go outside, so I sat on my suitcase just inside the doorway until I stopped shaking. People walked around me now like I was parting a wave. Some totted. I was finally taken downstairs by a woman wearing an orange and blue headscarf like a tall crown. She stood before me, a child's fingers in one hand and a huge suitcase in the other, and told me I must stand up. I could not stay there. A dress made of the same fabric poked out from underneath her coat and swished against the steps as she turned to instruct her husband to help me with my suitcase. It was from Uganda, like her, she said, when I reached the bottom of the steps to the station. A spiky clock on the stone arch outside showed the time was after five. A man with a wide-brimmed hat threw his cigarette on the floor 
and stamped down on it. His warm tingle of an accent from home told me that this was the right place. And there she was waiting a little way off, Jacqueline. She was still, hands in her pocket as if undecided. I screamed her name and ran to her, wrapping my arms around her shoulders. She was stiff in my arms and shorter than I remembered, and her hair poked out of a scarf tied around her chin. I let go. You get here all right then? She said, unsmiling. Cold rain began to fall in my head. I began waiting for you inside, I said. She gazed down at the grease marks on my lemon and lime dress, on the flicks of mud washing down my wet legs. Why everyone still coming up in their best summer dress? You know how many get knocked down with flu and bronchitis and pneumonia the minute they get off the boat. Shall we go then? Tomorrow, before I go, can you iron my hair? Me can't turn up looking like this, I said. Looking like what, she said. Like a wild woman, I said. Me na England now. It was raining harder now. The pavement began to glisten. The street lamps were coming on and they glowed on the pavement. The rain dripped off Jacqueline's eyelashes and sudden puffs of fluff hung off her large beige coat. At her waist I could see, for the first time, a collection of little plaits dripping too. They belonged to a small girl with warm eyes and a mouth set in a grim line. She stood behind her, holding onto Jacqueline's coat. Darine, she said. This your cousin Jean. Hello, darling, I said, holding out my hand. Nice to meet you. Darlene stared at my hand, eyes not blinking. Me think you're not coming, I said to Jacqueline. I waited so long. I had to pick Darlene from school first, she said, narrowing her eyes against the drops. Well, let's go. She picked up my suitcase. For the first time, I saw that every building, lofty stone tower to the great empire, was smeared in a grime like London needed a big wash. There was no need here for verandas to shade from the sun. No need for brightly painted buildings. Jacqueline, you don't have an umbrella? I said. Darlene left it on the bus last week, she said. Jacqueline pointed to a bus stop down the road. So we run, motor cars and buses and lorries, thundering dirty splashes at us until we reach the bus shelter. I am on shift tonight so you can sleep in my bed. Long as you don't mind Darlene in there with you. I will put you on the train tomorrow after we drop her at school, said Jacqueline. Darlene was between us. One of her socks had fallen down, grey with sodden water. I thought we could spend time together, I said. You're not going to take me to the nurse's home? Jacqueline did not answer. How old are you, Darlene? I said. Five? I stared at Jacqueline, though she did not catch my eye. My, you a big girl. You like school? She kept her head down and grabbed her mother's hand. She don't talk much said Jacqueline. We waited in a wet silence. I watched the rain catch Darlene's coat sleeves. My blazer was soaked, my dress cold against my legs. Jacqueline stared ahead at the traffic, her face lit by the street lamp 
was pale with tiny bumps around her temples. Why you not tell me about Darlene? I whispered. So many letters I sent you and you never write back? You know, Darlene, I did the same journey as your cousin Jean from all the way home, said Jacqueline aloud. She looked down at the little girl. No one come to fetch me. Why doesn't she call you Jackie, mommy? said Darlene. She is calling you a long name. That was my old long name, said Jacqueline, from before. A big red bus roared up the road towards us. When it came to a standstill, Darlene stepped up onto the platform and went to find a seat inside. I pulled myself up by a cold shining metal pole. The ridges of the platform floor were slippery. Jacqueline followed and pointed to the seats where Darling was climbing up. The windows behind us were misted and the bus seat was damp against my legs. Jacqueline asked the tall, dark conductress with a navy peak cap if she could stow my suitcase in a cubby hole behind her. The conductress moved aside, reaching up towards a string suspended from the low, rounded ceiling of the bus. The sharp pulls and the bell went. The bus shuttered and pulled off. Jacqueline stood in front of me and Darlene, holding onto the pole. You know her? I said, excited. I pointed at the conductress who headed upstairs calling, tickets please. She sounded like a warm piece of home on this soggy bus. No, said Jacqueline. Should I? You don't want to sit, I said. She shook her head. The bus trundled along, the bray of the engine rising and falling as if struggling along the street. I leaned forwards towards Jacqueline looking at Darlene. She looked like Lenworth, I said. Jacqueline shrugged and looked at her bitter nails. I hear him leave for Canada. He never went there, she said and snorted. She saw my jaw drop and nodded. It was as if she saw me for the first time, like when we used to spill over with news for each other. In the old days, he told everyone he was going there so he could come marry me here. But him never turn up. Then I found out through one of the girls at work that all the time him really living in a stoke Newington. When I find out I leave work, take two buses to go up there and show the man his child, said Jacqueline. She spoke in pointed, quiet hisses. So, there was me in the street, screaming up at the window, telling him to come down and be a man and look after him daughter. And me see his face like a little ferret behind the drapes while his big woman come out and threaten me. Says she the wife and she going to call the police if me come near her family. She licked her unpainted lips. No, and scratched up the scalp through her scarf. Me look upon Darlene's face just then. She was only three. That look made me turn, hide and go home. We never see him again. How you been coping? I said. I get cleaning work, she said. In my head, the letter to my mother was getting longer. Her precious Jacqueline was Jackie, the charwoman. Why are you looking at me like that? She said. Nothing, I said. You're not nursing? You think every hospital let unmarried woman with a child work on the ward? She said and sucked her teeth. 
the bus went slowly around a large roundabout with tall red brick buildings. The big arch of the station was behind us. Anywhere, I move away from the place and start back to nursing last year. It's easier now, Darlene, at school, she said. Her hands begin to bang on the pole. I tell them that I am a widow. Lord, this boss need to hurry up. And at night, I said, she gave me a look then that make my head call from the roots. I do not do night shifts, she said, usually. The conductress came along now, clicking out strips of tickets on her machine. Jacqueline made no move to pay her fare, so I did. The woman turned a handle on her little grey machine and handed me three tickets. I gave Jacqueline hers and Darlene's. Your mother can take Darlene, like Vera, mother doing for her. You remember Vera? You could come back here then, I said. Jean, I look like I come off the last banana boat, she said. You think I look stupid? Her finger jabbed towards me. The words were like bits. I've been wanting to see you so much, but you late and you even take a night shift when you know you're supposed to be picking me up, I said. Man, you're cold. You're worse than this weather. I knew it was you come tell my mother about Lenworth and that is why she threw me out, she said. Her face was twisted into a snare. That is why I never hear from either of them, not even when Darlene born. All I get is one letter asking if I can come pick you up, her precious one. I didn't know, I said, unswallowed. I swear it. Didn't know what, she said. That me stand outside your house waiting for you to open up like old times. Knocking and knocking. You want to swear you didn't hear me? On your mother's life. My mouth clapped shut. For some time, the bus stopped at traffic lights. Why you come to get me then? I said. Jacqueline looked at me and then out of the window. The rain spattered against the glass and more February cold seat in through the open doorway of the bus. A woman sitting on the other side of Darlene got up and Jacqueline took her place. They stared straight ahead as the bus pulled away. <laughs> Jacqueline, written by Tatum Anderson and read by Juliet Jordan. The producer was Martin Nathan. If you're enjoying our podcast, don't forget to subscribe so you can listen to a new story every month. Goodbye.